Howdy, 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 my name is Anashi Sasuke, and I'm not 100% sure what to call this video because it's going to be a little bit different than what I usually do. Now, the first thing is, Dewan Warren asked me yesterday, uh, they, or they said I should check out a fan-made interpretation of the battle the trolls had against the king, uh, since we don't get to see that. And he said that maybe I could do a video reaction to it, like, just with audio or something. So, I decided for the first half, well, first bit of the video, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to play the video, which was done by Christian Floyd, among with some other people. Let's see. There's a whole bunch of stuff under the MSPA forums. Uh, the song itself go to that album, which I don't even think is there anymore. And just all the things that started it. But, um, I'm going to check that out and I'm going to talk about it a little bit. And then the rest of the episode is going to be some side stuff from the SCP Wiki that I didn't want to waste time doing whole episodes on. So I'm going to do the first bit of the episode is going to be Homestuck, the second bit of this is going to be SCP, therefore I have no idea what to call it. So I'm going to full screen this and I'm going to shut up while the video plays.
Okay, so... I thought that I had seen that before, but for one thing, apparently I've never seen the entire thing. And the second thing, I don't know why the middle, like, most of the fighting... I thought it was something with my computer, but for whatever reason, it decided to stop being in HD for half the video. And it went back to being HD at the end of it. I don't know why that happened. Honestly, I have no idea why that happened. But, for all the people who worked on that video, that was fantastic. I'm a really big fan of when there's music videos where percussion bits of the music go along with what's happening in the animation. Really big fan of when that happens. That's awesome. Also, I forgot about the fact that the Black King, when the trolls fought him, had all the powers of their various Lusai because they prototyped their Lusai and Feffery had the, like, the underwater horror terror. And I, I assume that was the vast glove that it used towards the end of the fight, which should have made them all immediately die. I don't know why it didn't make them all immediately die, but the vast glove, from what I understand, just kills you no matter what the hell is supposed to have happened to you. I like that they had Gamzee just freak out and blow up one of its heads with its horns. There were a lot of a lot of things in here that I think were possibly assets they pulled from Homestuck itself, but there's nothing wrong with that because a lot of this was their original effort. And Hussey himself, I believe, said that he wanted to do an animation for that, but there was no time, so they took it upon themselves to do that. And they released it on 612, so it's just every it was a really good video. I still don't know why it decided to not be HD anymore for the middle of the fight, but just for the sake of, like, understanding, for once, that was not my computer's fault, that was YouTube. I don't know why it did that, but that was YouTube, not my computer. But it was a great video, I'm glad that I watched that, I'm glad that I, like, have that having had happened. So, that being said, uh, congratulations again to all the people who made that, that was awesome. Now let's move on to some of the SCP weirdness. Now, the thing behind the SCP weirdness is I was browsing through TV tropes trying to find out why some of my viewership is coming from TV tropes. I still haven't figured that out yet, but it led me to find out that there are some things from the SCPs I've already done that I either completely missed or didn't even know was in there at all. Like, for example, this is a story about one of the SCPs, the one where they have to do a protocol, I think it's Project Montauk or something? Whatever it was, there's an SCP where what they have to do to them to keep them in check is so terrible that people have gone insane, or killed themselves, or asked to be brainwashed so they didn't even know what happened. And not only are there things written within the page about that, as in having to go to, um, I think it's view page source or view page info, you have to go in there to find out more things about that SCP. And there's an eventually a story about that, which is that here. So, for the SCP things, we're going to be covering a story of SCP-106, which you guys may remember as the one that makes me intensely uncomfortable to look at its face. Um, the story about that SCP, which the number of the SCP I can't remember, all I know is it sounds like it's really interesting and I want to read that one. And then there's Experiment Log for uh, 261, which is the vending machine that can make anything. And a lot of these sounded hilarious, and I had no recollection of having ever seen them, and it's because I didn't actually go back for the experiment long. So, first off, this one is Treats, which is apparently SCP-106 doing something during Halloween. Okay, so, I would like to here again state that 106 is not, as is commonly believed, a basic predator on par with an advanced shark. 106 is a sentient being, albeit a totally alien one. 106 appears to be aware of several things beyond the scope of pure instinct and genetic memory. SCP-106 consistently breaches at moments where recovery and containment are most difficult. A fox may see his way out of a trap, but only a man will wait for his captors to look away to escape. Dr. Alec on sentience and contained humanoids. <sighs> for fuck's sake, where the hell is it? Agent Wang sighed, rubbing his face through his mask. The night was chill, but all three men were sweating badly. All around them surged horrors, monsters, demons, fantasy beasts, and animate, uh, animate objects, giggling and roaring as they wandered. The three men in gas masks and armored suits looked underdressed, if anything. As they stood, one man suddenly reached out a gloved fist, grabbing a mildly drunk zombie and tugging it close for a few seconds, before releasing him back to the surge of humanity, the undead beast cursing and stumbling away. Fucking Halloween bullshit! We need to steal this whole area. Agent Drax shook his head, gesturing to the traveling packs of costume revelers. The rail car popped too close to the city. It wasn't even supposed to be on this track. They they think MC and D might have buggered up something. Can't clamp the whole town without a major fallout. 
And what the hell do they think will happen now? The old bastard is out there, and we can't even fucking find him! When kicked a discarded rapper glaring through tinted lenses at any everyone who didn't have to have to chase hell for a living. Drag patted the fumy man on the back. Easy big fella. Command figures the old man takes a couple people, then does this lazy crocodile thing. That's easier to cover than a than why a major city had to be quarantined on Halloween. Parks, until now little more than a statue, cracked in with his broken, rusty voice. How hard is it to find a rotten old man that kills everything it touches? Wang shook his head, still scanning the crowd. He just looks like an old man most of the time. He can look however he wants. Normally would tell people to just follow the screaming. Fat fucking lot of good that does now. Where the hell is our expert? A brittle creaking chuckle over rolled over the radio. <laughs> Arkin says he's much of an expert on 106 as a plane crash survivor is an expert on aviation. They won't field lab techs until our initial eval or on our own for now. The three men stood awash in horrors, looking for one that would put all the rest to shame. The drunk angel wandered on the edge of the fire. Demons, zombies, and pop culture icons swirled around her, moving like a single mass before scattering into small clusters and pairs, only to surge back together again. The bonfire seemed to roar in time with the pounding music, the field chosen for the sudden teen invasion just far enough to avoid noise complaints but not far enough to attract unwanted adult oversight. Alcohol flowed, people giggled, and the sharp snap of lowered inhibitions and teen angst was thick in the chill air. The night was still young, yet already several pairs had drifted from the comfort of the fire to seek other comforts in the dark private woods ringing the town. The angel glared at the silent trees, taking another pull in an almost empty beer. She drained it, then tossed it down to meet a holocaust of its brothers being slowly kicked and stampeded in, in the soft dirt, or stamped. She should be there, being held in warm arms, kissing a warm mouth, but no. She decided to run with the one boy who seemed to think the moment before a party was the best time to bring up his worries about our relationship. Bastard. The angel, now with lopsided wings, started to wander around these cool, dark trees. Fuck him. If he wanted to toss her aside, fine. But that didn't mean she wouldn't get to have fun still. She giggled a bit, smiling for the first time in a while. Why not have a little fun, play a trick and get her treat? She laughed, the flush of wicked amusement and booze high in her cheeks. She'd seen one of the boys from her study hall wander back here. Maybe she could find him, get a bit little better acquainted. She walked in the cool dark the cooler darkness, the occasional giggle, snip of whisper, and a flash of glow stick to the only indication of life. She stumbled over a root, staggering forward, embracing her hand on a slimy tree trunk. She yanked her hand away almost instantly, the gritty oozing texture making her palm burn. The loss of support almost sending the angel sprawling. She squinted at her hand, making out a smear of gritty, fibrous jelly coating it. The burning getting worse as she noticed the odd pits eaten into the trunk of the tree. The angel shivered, suddenly sober, and very aware of the fact that nobody knew where she was. That she knew nobody close enough to even call for. Her. Knew of nobody close blah, blah, blah. She tried to rub her palm against her poofy skirts, not noticing the red and black smear she made on it, eyes wide and staring, some deep, dim part of her primordial brain ringing an alarm. She started to walk, quickly, focusing on the waving beacon of the bonfire, trying to make herself feel silly, to ignore the swelling, unreasoning panic. A twig broke behind her. She froze. A white shade, one hand dripping blood from a corrosive injury she would have to would have been horrified about had she looked. The angel didn't dare look back, but she was too terrified to run, to hear something following, reaching, grabbing. Moments passed, filled with nothing. The angel finally resolved to run right at the moment when a thin, bony hand reached through her costume and into the muscles of her back like a nasty child squishing his hands into a cake. She screamed, or tried to. The sound squelched a little more than a harsh bark by the sheer volume of pain, limbs suddenly boneless and leaden, nerves dead except for agony. She felt figures touching her ribs from the inside, even as they were slowly eaten away and corroded, her body shifting slowly to face the hand's owner. The flicker of the distant fire showed something withered, dark. Slimy and pulpy soft, but wiry and strong. Two milky black eyes glistened at her and a too large head, hovering over a frozen corpse grin, teeth thin and chipped. The pinned angel gasped and blubbered, feeling an oily burning sensation seeping into her body, trying to ignore a slow falling feeling, trying not to feel the ground below her turning mushy and soft, swallowing both figures inch by inch. It leaned closer, and despite the searing horror of that face, some still sane part of her welcomed what was surely an approaching end to her pain. It lingered, however, 
the other twisted claw of a hand rising as the ground started to swallow their hips. The new touch made the angel lucid with a new fear, her face locking onto those rotten eyes. She recognized the shine behind them and started to scream with a new, repulsed horror, even as it started to pull both her dress and skin away in sodden ribbons. Yeah. Jason ran, lungs burning, trying to yell for help between sharp gasps of air. His Batman costume felt like a joke now, running between streetlights, feeling that warm spot of pee on his pants. Where was everyone? It had been so stupid trying to be the big brave kids and go out alone. Now he really was alone, and his friends had probably been eaten. He didn't know this for sure, but when the boogeyman dropped out of a tree and started shoving kids into a wall that was suddenly like quicksand, it was probably a safe bet. He hadn't even been able to do anything, just watch as those long, bony fingers grabbed his two best friends and just yanked them away, like dolls, barely screaming before the squishy black wall gulped them up. The boogeyman it hooked his fingers into David's eyes like Dad had taught him to hold a bowling ball and... Jason was abruptly sick down the front of his costume, the half-digested mass of chocolate looking unsettling like the goo that had splattered everywhere while the tall, lanky, naked old man had landed out of the tree. He stopped, stumbling to his knees, coughing and gagging, wailing out a weak scream for help to the dim night. It drifted off unheeded, the boy unable to even sob, too numb with exhaustion and horror. He barely noticed the footsteps until they were nearly on top of him. He looked up, ready to beg whatever adult he saw for help. Then he saw the legs. Thin, black, the feet looking pulpy and flat with age, the concrete under them cra turning cracked and gooey. Jason looked up more, shaking more and more violently. The withered hips, the sticky, soft chest that didn't rise or fall. And finally that nightmare head, looking like some kind of a rotten pumpkin but black and oily as a bucket of tar. The eyes locked on the boys, as shiny and blank as a flashlight in a basement. The teeth parted, some kind of rolling, slimy blackness shifting inside. Jason stumbled back, gasping, trying to scream, but unable to even breathe correctly. He stared at the boogeyman as he rolled something in the palm of that thin, beaten hand, pulling it between two bony fingers and lifting it to his mouth. The boy thought it was a candy or something, but then he saw the glint of metal. It was his best friend Anthony's front tooth. It still had the, brace the bracket from his braces on it. The boogeyman placed it between his teeth. Gently, the tooth still white and clean in that filthy, dripping mouth. It seemed to hold it there for a moment. Then his jaw bunched and the tooth shivered, then burst like a jawbreaker under a car tire. He chewed it twice, then just stopped, still staring at the boy. It seemed to go on and on. Jason unsure if he was even breathing anymore, knowing this was the end. This was what happened when you didn't listen, when you went off alone. The boogeyman came and took you forever and always. But he didn't. He turned, seeming to get ready to take a step, then fell forward slowly like an old man tripping over a shoe. The black monster almost hit the ground, but just fell through it like it was made of air. Nothing but a black smear left behind on the concrete and the tiny corroded bracket from the tooth. When they found him hours later, he gripped it hard enough to embed it in his palm. The boy sat, comforted and miserable. His mother had been nice enough to let him at least wear his Mario costume, but even he had to admit he was probably too sick to walk around the house, let alone outside for hours in the cold. He'd woken up vomiting and had just continued, his parents hoping for the best, but finally forced to cancel the trick-or-treating. As sad as he was, they did try to make, try their best to make it up to him. There was a small bowl of candy for him, with the promise any leftovers would be given to him and he could watch all the scary movies he liked. Knock knock. Trick-or-treat! Oh, such a cute turtle. And where are you, honey? I'm Rapunzel! Well, here you go, princess. Thank you! He hadn't even wanted to help pass things out. It was better to just try and ignore things, just pretend everyone else was inside, too. That made it better. He tugged the floppy hat down a bit, trying to convince himself that his tummy wasn't feeling like a hedgehog was rolling around inside. He watched the zombies lurch across the screen, half wishing that the screaming people running for the house were kids from school. Knock, knock. Trick or treat! Oh, what a nice vampire! I'm Draculaura, rawr! So fearsome! Here you go! Thank you! He turned up the movie, the slow groans of the walking dead drowning out the happy shouts of the living. The worst was going to be tomorrow, being forced to listen to everyone, watching them eat, ca eating candy and talking about different houses and adventures. He sighed and swallowed thickly, his stomach doing another slow, oily roll. The boy pushed away the candy he'd been nibbling, suddenly sickened by even the smell. Knock. Hello? Uh... Uh, are you- OH GOD! 
The sudden rising shriek of his mother made the boy suddenly bolt upright, his stomach clenching even worse, but now totally forgotten. He couldn't see her from the couch, but he could hear the noises, thumping and muffled shouts, and some kind of slimy sounding rustle, like sewage over dry leaves. He stood and started to peer around the short wall blocking the entry entryway, calling with a hesitant voice, scared of not getting a response, but almost equally so of getting one. He was only a few feet away when the hand whipped around the wall, gripping it tight. It was black and gray and black gray and thin, as bony and thin skinned as his grandmother's, with a wide flat nails gripping the hard paint. Where it touched, a black stain was spreading like grease on a paper bag, the knuckles looking puffy and thick as they flexed. The boy stared, backing up slowly, calling again for his mother, his voice starting to plead. The hand flexed, actually sinking into the wall as that stain spread, and a nightmare peeped around the corner. The head was thick, misshapen and lumpy like a poorly made scarecrow, the skin thin and jelly-like. Two hard, glistening eyes the color of maggots stared at from above the thin, wide slash of a mouth. Their eyes locked and the boy felt fear wash from his head down to his feet, his stomach boiling like a forgotten kettle. His nerves screamed to run, to run away, but he couldn't make himself stop watching those eyes. Feet moving slowly backwards like a sleepwalker. The hand and face shifted a bit and there was a wet, heavy dragging noise as his mother was pulled into view. She was dead, or close to it, moved forward by the hand in her chest like a sock puppet. Bits of her black, bits of her black and pulpy, smears of that black stain eating in, into her face, her neck, her arms. Her chest was a black, jelly-coated hole. The thing's other hand buried in it up to the wrist, the bloodless, ruined remains of his mother dangling from it like a rag doll. He screamed, then threw up, little more than a mass of bile and half-digested snacks, then ran shrieking up the stairs, begging for his mother's father, anyone, someone. He slammed into the bathroom, shutting and locking the door, shaking and crying. His dad had gone down the street to visit. He'd be home any second if he'd fix this somehow. He called the cops or something. Get them out of the house, leave that black thing far behind. Maybe mom was just hurt. People could get really hurt and still be fine. He'd only seen her a few, for a few seconds. That thing was just some psycho in some costume. He'd probably run off as soon as he heard someone coming, and it'd be okay then. It'd be fine. He kept whispering this to himself, feet braced on the sink, back against the door. He was still repeating it when the face pushed through the wood above him. He heard the crackle and looked up to see the hell face looking down inches above his head. The floor under his feet suddenly felt sludgy and soft as he stared, the mouth splitting open to let a tongue as rotten and bloated as a dead fish roll free and down and down, sliding down into that horrified face like a syrup, burning even as he felt his legs sinking down and down, unable to even move really as that soft, slimy flesh burned like an acid into his face. Feeling his nose cooked down like an overused eraser, screaming just long enough to catch a few feet of that endless tongue in his mouth, gagging hard before the nerves died, starting to pass out as he felt the nightmare tasting his eyes. Draco woke feeling like he was sleeping in a pile of rusty car parts, he sat up, twisting and trying to locate the source of the throbbing pain in his leg, that memory starting to flood back, hitting like a freight train. Running across town, slamming through a crowd, seeing the withered, crumbling arm lying on the ground, screams, people running, the horrible black face sliding from the ground. Eyes locked on his, parks firing, more screams, a withered hand reaching, gripping, pulling. Oh god, no. He looked around in welling horror, pleading with his own brain to lie to him. The room was dark dirty and low ceilinged, tufts of dirt and debris in the corners, <clears throat> the grayish paint peeling in ragged streamers, the stained ceiling and floor warped and lumpy, a doorway opened into darkness, a vague insistent noise sounding from far off, the light was dim, but didn't seem to come from anywhere, just seeming just a weak, omnipresent glow with a slightly green cast, like deep ocean water. Drac knew this room even though he'd never been here, at least one's very much like it. The old man liked to dub his new catches before he, here before he found them. Jack rose quickly, hunching down to avoid a sagging bulge of ceiling. He barely wanted his shoes touching this place, let alone anything else. He wins, feeling a dull, empty ache in his leg high in the calf, probably where it grabbed him and damned if he was going to check it. He limped a few steps, making sure it could bear weight, eyes sweeping over every surface. He breathed slow, deeply, remembering the file, the brief. Time was subjective, he could have been out for seconds or weeks. It liked to play cat and mouse, tracking through its home or playroom or whatever the fuck it was. Space was endless, but sometimes people got out or were released. Keep moving, don't hide because it, it was God here and it would know. 
He felt panic slithering around the edges of his brain and pushed it down, hard, face set and grim as he stepped out into the darkness beyond the doorway. The hallway was long and broken, like a hospital hallway after an earthquake. No big holes, just twisted and tilted oddly. He creeped down, as close to a wall as he could get without touching it, feeling gritty plaster crunch under his feet. The noise was louder, the sound of a high-pitched, monotonous crying. It set the teeth on edge, but they said it would be like this. The key was to keep moving, keep looking. Yes, it was endless, but if you kept on the move, it seemed like 106 got confused or lost track of things and you could accidentally wander back into the world. He kept repeating the steps, the briefing in his head like a prayer, ignoring the part where 106 would typically hunt escapees forever. He took a right at the end of the hall, passing down another, then a left, starting to move faster, ignoring the odd corroded twists of pipe and wire in some of the rooms he passed, or the suggestive soggy mounds of... something. The crying kept getting louder, the high-pitched gurgling wail of a baby. Ignore it, keep moving. It called the shots, it could make the whole place sound like a dentist drove it wanted. Jack pounded down a hall, nearly at a dead run, trying not to see the growing dampness of the walls, the changing texture of things, broken plaster over old greenish bricks, floor going from broken vinyl to concrete to dirt. He turned a corner too fast, a gooey patch of black causing his foot to skitter, nearly dropping him to his knees as he clutched the bare, wet brick wall. He looked out in the dim, mossy room, the sound of helpless, angry crying, very, very loud now. He froze, staring, half crouched and clutching the wall. It was standing in the middle of the room, a thick, ankle-deep puddle of black jelly at its feet. The old man was turning, slowly, rocking in slow side-to-side -side motions. The crying was coming from the thing in its arms. It was a torso, wrapped in masses of what looked like barbed wire. The wire threaded in and out of flesh, some places looking like the bleeding skin had flowed like warm taffy over it. The ragged remains of the limbs twisted and stretched, every movement making the wires dig and tear more. It was hairless, the skin of its oh, bare, head, oh, bare head and neck pe looking peeled and rotten, the face of a, a mask of pain. The throat had been opened carefully, twisted and held with wires. The baby crying was in fact this grown, mute torso, mutilated to make that pitiful, helpless wail. The old man was watching him, face turned, eyes locked to the man as he slowly tried to stand upright, ignoring the hissing of his boots, trying not to think of what would, it, would have to be done to a throat to make it sound like a baby in agony, or where that pitiful torso's limbs had gone. It watched him, cracked teeth slightly parted, and slowly stopped its rocking. It dropped the wire-bound bundle, arms going limp at its sides as the mass of flesh and pain bounced off the ground, then rested face down in the mossy grime, sending up a new wave of protest between bubbly, sucking breaths. It turned to face him, arms dangling, body wrapped in what looked like some kind of shredded cloth oozing black fabric. Of oozing black fabric. Jack ran, bolting like a scared deer, throwing training and conditioning to the wind in the mad, blind, animal panic of escape. He screamed, panted, talked, laughed, anything to drown out the sound of the slow, stuttering steps lurking behind him. He ran, and ran and ran, falling and hitting the ground like he'd been hit by a car, gasping and waiting for the end, the end, muscles throbbing. Then they would start again, those soft, rustling footsteps driving him on, and on, and on. He didn't know it, but he'd run for four days before the old man started taking chunks out of him. Recovery was in the pre-dawn hours with no sun or moon, and went shockingly smooth, all things considered. SB-106 was found in the middle of a field, making pumpkins sag and burst by squeezing or stepping on them. The man, or the team, a man short, was finally reinforced an hour before they caught it, pushing it back to the recovery chamber with that blue, the big halogen sun guns, nearly blinding two of the recovery crew in their zeal to have the old man back under lock and key. It sat in the cell without a moment's attempt to try and escape. It sat and did nothing. Head tilted, arms and legs limp. One MTF, MTF member stated that it looked sated, and was told to to shut up in an official capacity. Disappearances were glossed over, murders quieted and made unnewsworthy, urban legends seated and caressed. Overall, it went well once the hell was over. Weeks later, an observation tech made a note in the day's log. 106 was observed to suddenly produce a large handful of small white objects, later identified as teeth and finger bones and set the pile on the floor. It then sorted these objects in what, into what seemed random piles, later identified as separated by age of victim. It then stared at these items for several hours, then recollected them. The significance of this was considered unworthy of contemplation. 
Okay, so, first things first, that took a lot longer than I thought it would. And second thing, that was, I don't, I don't, I don't know why I thought that wasn't going to be that horrifying, but that was much, much more horrifying than I was expecting it to be. I thought it was going to be something silly? Not silly like, haha, that's funny, I just, I did not fully grasp the, the uh, the consequences of SCP-106 getting out on Halloween. That being said, now it's time to read the one that might be blasphemous to some people. Uh, Yahweh walked through a wheat field in the southwestern part of the Jezreel Valley, restless. He had not stayed much longer in the other valley, his valley. It had been entirely too disturbing, a scene for which he had no script. He could not recall any other time in which he had felt this way, at least not in his true memories. Those other false memories were still coiling through the, the back of his brain, serpents in the grass waiting to strike once trotting on. He had needed to get away, so he came here, to the place once called Megiddo, where the Armageddon War would be fought, would still be fought. Because these events changed nothing. Everything that was to transpire would still transpire. He may not have reckoned on having so many powerful alien opponents, but he was still the one true god. He still had a vast army of angels, an army that dwarfed any other in the history or imagination of man. He still had his locusts, the things the Foundation called O-98. He had all those and more. And on top of them, he had his horsemen. He had planned to summon the first horsemen to the unnamed valley before he'd been derailed, and this valley of Megiddo would have to do for now. The others he could simply approach the way he approached everyone, up close and personal, but not the first. Yahweh felt no need to to countenance the evil done to the first with his holy presence. presence. Not even though the evil had been done by his own followers. Not even though they th had wrought their evil for reasons they thought to be good ones. Yahweh stood in the middle of the wheat field and spoke the first name. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he sat, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering, and to conquer. The young woman lay restrained on her bed, watching the IV drip hooked up to her arm. She had spent most of her life with this bed she knew, since the age of nine. She was now in her late teens, though she wasn't sure of the year. She'd forgotten so much. As to who she was, well, she had also forgotten her name long ago. The people who came to see her called her by SCP-2317. She heard a voice in her head. Awaken, my child. Rise up and walk. The block in her mind, the blocks designed to keep her power contained, if only barely, all fell away at once. Birth pangs stabbed through her. She screamed louder than she ever remembered screaming before. There were no klaxons to blare at 2317's unnamed holding location, but there was shouting and panic and people in identi identical uniforms and explosive collars flooding the room. Containment breach! Restrain her! Restrain her! Initiate emergency procedures! But it was already much too late. SCP-2317, Conquest, the first her horseman of the apocalypse, had never been pregnant with a literal child. She had been pregnant with... herself. There was no better way of putting it. She had been containing her own power, and it had been building up stronger and stronger, honed in the fires of a thousand extended torture sessions that should have broken anyone beyond repair long ago. Because of this, it took her only seconds to give birth, and then... to ascend. Her eyes burned like white stars. In a moment, the network of scars and bed sores that covered her body vanished. Her skin shone brilli brilliantly like a... with a light beyond light, almost liquid. A robe that floated like water and fell, and gold fell up across her soldiers as the old hospital gown dissolved. A circlet of fire ignited in a halo around her head, set with a dozen pinpricks of gem-colored light. The men surrounding her dissolved in a flash of white light. She remembered her sisters, now all dead, whether by the fumbling of the Scarlet King's children and the fumbling of the Foundation after them. Rough drafts. Nephilim. She remembered where she had come from and why. She remembered Class A amnestics. She remembered... everything. Yahweh was startled momentarily, a foible of his human body's fight or, or fight or flight response to be sure, when Conquest appeared in the wheat field out of nowhere. She was not wearing her illuminated clothing, but rather an ordinary t-shirt and jeans contrasting with her shining flesh and burning crown. She was without her steed, the sleeping foam entity which once awakened could blanket a fourth of the world in its collective. And said she was accompanied by a translucent floating creature, all eyes and tentacles swimming in its own personal cloud, an atmospheric jellyfish. Your steed, Yahweh began. I found one I liked more, Conquest said. She patted the cloud jelly's side. It's white, isn't it? It does eat people sometimes, but right now I'm not sure if I care. 
She hesitated. I can speak so well. I can't remember the last time well. I can now, actually. So is this part of my power? She was angry, I would tell. My child, he began. It is time to forgive the Foundation for their transgressions. Don't talk to me about the Foundation. Yahweh was torn between becoming angry over her disrespect and interrupting him and the tolerant of her reaction to her liberation. She had been held by the Foundation for quite a long time. Perhaps he could afford to be indulgent. I'm not angry with the Foundation, Kagwa said. I'm angry with you. The venom in her tone made his brow furrow in aggravation. They didn't know what they were doing. Thought they were saving the world, but you, you could have told the Foundation what I was. You could have just taken me away from them. You could have done something. She paused to breathe. Even just a word to 0514. But you did nothing. Do you? Of course you do. You know exactly what they did to me. You know every last detail. And you did nothing. Yahweh frowned. H how do you know about 0514? She just looked at him. That's it? That's what you have to say? Yahweh sighed. He had no time for an argument. Not right now. Not after the ordeal in the valley. Answer my question. You have no idea how much power you gave me, do you? Now he was angry. Regardless, he said, you are mine. You are mine and you will obey. I don't think so. He stared at her flabbergasted at her gall. I'm not going to be your rider, she said. I don't belong to anyone. Never again. You gave me a whole lot of power and I'm going to use it. How... Then he read her mind. He didn't actually intend to, no. He did it without thinking to find the answer to his question. He was about to wipe her from existence. Not a harsh punishment, all things considered, if she was not going to be cooperative. Or he had been about to wipe her from existence. Until he read her mind and saw everything that was in there. Everything that she had ever felt, thought, experienced. And Yahweh did nothing. Conquest looked up at the stars. I think... I think I'm going to go explore the universe, she said. I don't know when I'll come back. Maybe in a few million years, maybe never. It doesn't really matter. Conquest rode into the sky with her clout jelly companion. No flash, no pomp, no fanfare. She just simply flew away, ascending towards the clouds and through them and past them. Yahweh watched her go. He did not try to stop her. He watched her until her she was a pinprick in the sky and kept watching until she vanished completely leaving Earth far behind. Um, it seems that this is a series of things. This one, the white horse, the conqueror with the golden crown, and then there's this one, the red horse, the ironic metaphor. What? The way the world ends. There's a, there's a whole lot of these. Okay, um, okay, so I'm going to save this. And I'm going to come back to this someday, after episode 100 on Friday. Okay, there's a there's a whole lot of these. Okay, um, and now let's check out some of the experiment log here. Let's see. They gave it 500 yen once, when it was powered, and it gave it a package of six standard Oreos in bright blue wrapping labeled in Spanish. The normal. Next time they gave it 500 yen, gave some Jolly Ranchers. Contained both standard flavors of green apple and watermelon with additional flavors of pomegranate, low quat, and blackberry. Current Jolly Ranchers are not known to contain these flavors. Edible. The hell is a low quat? Huh. So, while powered, they gave it 500 yen and got a spice bomb. A small gumball, red and orange, banded in color with packaging in Japanese. Tasted like jalapeno flavored gum. Very spicy. Testing was halted temporarily in order to allow the doctor to vomit and consume antacids. Powered 500 yen. Mountain Dew. Hot pink. Clear plastic bottle labeled in English. The liquid within is a brilliant pink color and proved to be edible, tasting very sweet and tart. Mild sugar high ensued. Flavor identified to be a mix of pomegranate and sour apple. 500 yen. Powered unknown. A small plastic box containing apparatus similar to heroin kit with a small vial of clear liquid labeled in unknown language. Found alternative researcher to use it. After injection subject reported the strong taste of mint and they smelled con constantly of peppermint for the next several hours, apparently coming from sweat and body oils. So they reported nausea after the first hour or so of this due to the constant smell and taste. Okay. 
500 yen, while powered. A USB capable device similar to a flash drive, packaging marked only with a barcode. When plugged into a computer, the computer ran at twice normal speed and refused to react to a mouse or keyboard movement, and appeared to be running several instances of the program Minesweeper at once. Object kept for potential testing with mechanical SCPs. 500 yen. Milk chocolate replica of a human male sexual organ approximately 6.5 inches from base to head. And foil wrapping with unknown language resembling Korean on label. Hollow, lit filled with liquid white chocolate. White chocolate. Reported to be delicious but a little too sweet. Note. More than half of the male staff avoided contact with the thing like it was made of explosives. It is funny that majority of staff here would prefer to have a picnic with 682 than touching a fucking penis shaped candy. Testing concluded. So, money entered 167 yen, got some Doritos. 200 yen, Hershey's with no nuts. However, the nuts match no uh, Hershey's with nuts, the nuts match no known species. 500 yen, green apple frosting, a container of green frosting with a green apple flavor, currently not produced by anybody. 500 yen, Lay's blooming onion, all, all dressed, an onion of average size and flavor, or color, cutting into it shows that it's made of many layers, each with a different color and tasting of a different flavor of chips, including some flavors not produced by Frito-Lay. Now, 500 yen when it's not on. A clear plastic package filled with water with tiny manta ray-like creatures swimming in it. Attached to it was a blue tablet and a plastic wrapper. When the top was open and the tablet was added, the water instantly froze with a loud pop. After the ice block was pulled out of the package, the ice turned to vapor and it left behind the creatures frozen solid. Each was described as having a slightly different flavor. So, 700 yen while on, naked fruit drink, berry flavored, normal, uh, 700 yen while on, edible chess set, it made from hard candy, candy similar in taste and texture to Pez, ew, packaging in French, 700 yen while on, human breast milk that's chocolate flavored, uh, very sweet, the doctor reported a sense of nostalgia, nothing unusual about the quality of the milk beyond its packaging, small label in Japanese, I think the boob shaped container was a nice touch, okay then. 1,000 yen while on. Build your own candy bots! A small bag containing various mixed parts that could be assembled in different ways to create tiny candy robots. Once completed, candy robots began to move on their own for approximately two minutes, walking about aimlessly and bumping into things. Very sweet, packaging in unknown language. Uh, 500 yen. 417 fruit. Room was evacuated briefly before the item and airtight packaging was said to be incinerated. Packaging in unknown language. We're going to find out what that is in tomorrow's episode of Let's Read the SP Foundation Wiki. Uh, money entered 100 yen. While powered, a suppository item was not used. The test run later show. Uh, test run later revealed mint flavoring and a high nutritional value. Packaging in unknown language resembling Greek, complete with diagram of how to use. 700 yen while powered, a bacon shirt. A simple t-shirt, dark red in color and plastic packaging, unknown language. A test revealed the shirt to be edible, wearable, and with a taste similar to bacon. No side effects from wearing the shirt, beyond a vague smell of bacon. 1,000- Okay, so there's a lot of these, and I think I should probably come back to it after I hit this line here. So, uh, money entered 1,000 yen while powered. Advertising bottle, a tall bottle of an unknown alloy with a twist off top and filled with a liquid resembling Pepsi Blue. The size of the bottle lit up and revealed animated advertisements featuring an attractive woman while being drank. Objects powered, objects powered down once liquid was fully drained. Advertisements and packaging in unknown language resembling archaic Japanese. 500 yen, reverse temperature cream puff. A packaged cream puff that grew warmer when exposed to cold and colder when exposed to heat. Placing it in the microwave caused frost to form and put it in the freezer resulted in it being burning hot. Tasted decent if a touch stale. Okay, so. Since this uh, particular video was pushing 50 minutes now, I want to stop here. So I just got to try to remember that we read up to the reverse temperature cream puff, and I'll come back to this next Wednesday. So, this has been Anashi Sasuke. I still don't really know what to call this video since it was both Homestuck and SCP Wiki. Um, if you liked it, a like and a subscribe will be groovy. If you didn't, you don't need to do either one of those things, and I'll see you all in the next one. Whatever the next one happens to be. Later!